Uh, Lord, we ask that uh, as Kevin and Sheila are ministering in Turkey, that you would move powerfully in the Lighthouse Church there and in the, that community that Matt started so many years ago and a part of starting. And we pray for uh, safety and all of that for the team, for Brad over with Matt as well in Greece. And, uh, but more than that, God, we do want safety, but we pray for uh, powerful encounters in the Holy Spirit, Amen. strength of God to be upon them, to deliver uh, all that you've sent them to deliver to those precious people. We ask your blessing upon them, your wisdom, strategy, and anointing to rest on Brad and, and Kevin and Sheila now. We're grateful to you for Scott and Julie. We pray your blessing upon them in their travels. We ask you to uh, just refresh them and encourage them this morning too, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I love Tony up here leading and uh, that time when he said, declare something about the awesomeness of God over your homes. We were singing those songs about uh, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And certainly that is the thing that we'll see at the end of the age. There will be a day, right, when every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. But in our lives in the present tense, there's a whole reality uh, that we need, to, we need to bow and confess and that circumstances and situations in our lives need to start to yield to the will of God. And so that's not what I'm talking about today, but I just loved that expression of what we were doing in worship this morning. And I'm glad Tony paused for us to take a minute to do that this morning. Uh, today, I, I, I have some things that I think might be somewhat hard to hear. And so I wore this shirt. Um, almost every time I wear this shirt, people go, man, Harry, that's a really nice shirt. So when I say something that might feel a little chafing to you today, just you know, momentarily in your own heart go, yeah, but he's wearing that nice shirt. So just soften the blow. Thank you, son. <clears throat> By the way, you can pray for me. I'm heading to Africa on Tuesday to see Becky, and uh, can't wait to see her. Uh, People always ask me, what are you going to do when you're there? Like, what, you know, what's your mission opportunity? I used to like it's hanging out with my daughter. Well, yeah, but what are you going to do? I'm going to hang out with my daughter. That's what I do. I have nothing else to bring but dad to daughter, you know, and so I'm super excited to be doing that. Anyway, I have a question for you today. Um, who do you want to be? Who do you want to be? Uh, you'll notice I ask you not what you want to be, but who do you want to be? I think it's a really important question. There's a, when I uh, randomly, you know, that once a month when I jog, um, I often put uh, this old, uh, I guess it's an album, but it's on my phone. So I don't know if it's an album then. But anyway, uh, uh, I put Switchfoot on in my head. Anybody know Switchfoot, that band? And, uh, and, there's a, and there's a song that right about when I hit about the two-mile mark, the guy says, are you who you want to be? And at that two-mile mark, I always say, not at all. <laughs> not in any way, shape, or form. And sometimes I feel that way in my own life, don't you? I'm not who I want to be yet. I'm not who I want to be in the Lord or in my relationship with Donna or my kids or, or with you guys or with my neighbors. I'm not who I want to be yet. And so who do you want to be? And of course, I'm old, and, and most of you are younger, and so when you're older, you might have different answers to that question than you do when you're younger. And so I want to invite you into that question and, and into that contemplation here this morning. Donna, would you come up here, please? Just, let me think. I'm going to look around. I've got to find a volunteer. Uh, John, would you go ahead and come on up? And uh, let's see. I'm going to need one more. Uh, Joel, would you come up here, please? So, Donna, you're going to stand over there. Yeah, yeah, come up on the stage. This is my lovely and talented wife. Here, Donna, take this end of that rope. I, I, I did a terrible thing here with the rope. It's a magic trick. Yes, it's a magic trick. It's going to magically disappear. Go ahead and go that way. Joel, you can be in the middle. Yeah, Joel's going to jump. Very nice. Uh, thank you. So spiritual priorities in our lives. Spiritual priorities. So I think about this. I think about how, what is your approach to the word of God? 
and, and, and for all of us, there's kind of this continuum of how we view life. And, and so the Word of God, is it the most important thing in your life? Is it the driving force to what you believe? Do you, do you take in the Word of God and meditate upon it and have it shape your values and it rules and reigns and supreme, supremely over everything? That would be Donna, of course. <laughs> right? At this continuum, this is the person, this is the one that loves the Word of God, and, and everything they do is informed by the Word of God. And then some people are kind of in the middle, and the Bible's really important to them, it's valuable. It informs them, but maybe doesn't lead them. It, they, we sample the Word of God, we ponder it, we let it be a part of the math equation, but it doesn't lead us and guide us. And then some people way over there, they don't give a rip. Uh, it might be nice literature. It might be, uh, you know, Jesus is a factual guy. So Jesus also maybe said some cool things. And uh, maybe, maybe once in a while I should listen to its nice poetry. And maybe there are good axioms. There are good spiritual myths or journal or things in the word of God. Some of us in our faith, in our walk with God, we see God as the central purpose, the central being of our lives. The one that we love to worship, the one we love to follow, the one that, we, that, that is carrying us through life. Somebody said something about that today. Tony talked about that at the beginning of the, if you missed the beginning, you missed a great sermon at the beginning. That God wants to yoke himself to us and be our strength. And, and so we, we hear his heart. We listen to his heart. We, we fellowship with him. We abide in him. And that, of course, would be Donna. And then over here in the middle, it's, well, you know, my relation with God is kind of important. You know, I'm, 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 I'm a little, I'm, I'm, I'm like kind of thinking about the things of the kingdom. I'm walking with God kind of. He doesn't guide all of my decisions, but... You know, he's a part of it. And then, of course, over there, <laughs> with the people that are far away from God, they don't care about him at all. <laughs> I was going to have Dan do that, but I asked you, John. <clears throat> How you guys doing so far? You guys doing all right? Okay. You got like 30, 40 more minutes in you? Okay, good. <laughs> I want to read a passage to you, and then we're going to talk about it a little bit, but I'm going to leave them up there just for one more minute. To the angel of the church of Laodicea write, the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So he looks over at Donna and he says, you are hot. <laughs> right? Thank you. <laughs> More ways than one. She is hot. She is near the fire. You with me so far? And over there, John, he's cold, man. But God says this. He says, I wish you were either hot or cold. Why? Because this guy knows he doesn't know God. This guy knows he's, his values are all messed up. Deep in his own heart, he knows he's got problems. He doesn't know how to fix it. He doesn't think God is real, but he's, but he's lost and he's spinning in life. He says, I wish you were hot like Donna or cold like John, because Joel here has real problems. Joel has massive problems, y'all. The Bible says that Jesus himself said, I wish you were like Donna or John and not like Joel. Okay, we're going to talk about that more. You guys can sit down. Thank you. You're on the continuum and you ain't doing good, bro. Sorry. <laughs> I only bring people on the stage that I love. This passage in Revelation 3 is famous. Preachers love to preach Revelation 3 about the Laodicean church. The churches love to 
beat the sheep. And uh, you wretched Laodiceans, you know. It's not what I'm here to do today. But I want to call us to something a little bit different. Who do you want to be? You see, this letter was written to the church, not to unbelievers. And he says, Harry, I don't want you to be, he doesn't want us to be cold. I want you to be hot. I want you to be near the fire, Harry. And I don't want you to be lukewarm. Now, now let me just talk about being lukewarm for a minute. How many of you know lukewarm is warmer than cold? Can you, can you understand that, that science? Is that science? Yeah. Biology? It's not biology. It's physics, maybe. Is it physics? Thank you. I got C's and D's in science and biology and all that. It was the one class I ever got a D in my life was those. All of them. Cold seems like it's worse, doesn't it? But that guy that's cold understands he's in a problem. The problem with the guy that's lukewarm is that he thinks he has it going on. He says, I'm going to read it again. He says, I know your deeds, verse 15, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot, so that because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now listen to verse 17. Because you say, I am rich. I've become wealthy. I have need of nothing. You don't know that you're wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Here's what happens to believers. We get, we get going in the faith, and we take some steps, and our hearts warm up, and we get all the way up from uh, 32 to about 37 degrees. We go, man, I'm warming up. I'm growing in the Lord. And then we like kind of hit this plateau. We think we've arrived. We think we've got it going on. I am now rich. Thank God I'm not like John, right? I'm, I'm not 32 anymore. I'm not 32 degrees anymore. I'm 37. I'm growing in the Lord. And we end up pausing. We end up uh, plateauing. We end up just sit, settling for less than God has for us. Because you say you're rich. Because you don't know how weak and how you know, struggling you truly are. He says, that's such a bad place, you guys. I can't stand it out for you. I, I don't understand iced coffee. That, to me, is an oxymoron, is it not? <laughs> I don't understand that, but I know many of you drink it, and God bless you. I want steaming, hot, black coffee. That's what I want. I have the restaurants. They always say, do you want cream and sugar? I say, no, I'm a straight black man. And, and, they, and they do what you say you're doing right now. I did it one time on accident. I just keep doing it now. Now it's just for fun. I said that to a lady. I said, I'm a straight black man. And this African-American waitress went. And so ever since then, I've just been doing it on purpose. It was literally, it was an accident the first time. Hot coffee is amazing. You guys think iced coffee is too. I, have, I wouldn't dare try. But how many of you know lukewarm coffee is the worst thing in the world? Amen. And I spit it out my mouth, man, I do. Why? Because it's not what it should be. God says, hey, you guys, I know you're lukewarm right now. That's okay. You know what? If, to get to lukewarm, you had to get warmer than cold, right? There was growth. There was progress. There were things going on in your life that got you warmer. You were going closer to the flame. You were going closer to the fire of God. But somehow, someplace, I just tapped the brakes, pushed pause, and settled. Being lukewarm is not about temperature. It's about temperament. It's not about are you cold or hot. It's about what are you running after. And God says, listen, if you're just pausing, if you're just, if you're just keeping me at arm's distance, I just got to spit that out of my mouth. I can't stand it. If there's something God hates, there's a, many things the Word of God tells us, you know, that he doesn't care for. But it's if we're just ambivalent about him. Our hearts aren't moved. We're not engaged. If you're lukewarm, he says, I will spit you out of my mouth. He says, because you say, 
I'm rich, I don't have any needs. It reminds me of the story, and we never want to be thought of as Pharisees, right? Because if, if you know your Bible, the Pharisees were the hard-hearted religious leaders of Jesus' day. And in Luke 18, there's a story, and Jesus tells this parable. He says, there was this terrible, rotten sinner who said, oh God, he wouldn't even lift his head to the Lord because he was so broken by his spiritual status. He says, God, I just, I'm awful. I just, I need you desperately. And then he turned to the Pharisee, the strong, religious, charismatic South Gadian, and he says, man, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like John. I fast twice a week. I put my money in the box. I go to church. And Jesus said, that's the guy. I couldn't care less about. It's that guy that's humble and broken before me, the one that's trying to get closer to the flame, the one that's trying to get closer to the fire. That's the one I want to pay attention to. And sometimes I just see it in my own life where, where I settle. It's like, hey, I'm kind of doing good. I think I'll pause. I think I'll relax in my spiritual walk. And may I encourage you today that who you want to be is not that guy. Who you want to be is not the one that pushes pause, that, that takes a step back. Jesus said it like this in the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. He said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those that understand their brokenness. Blessed are those that understand they don't have it all figured out. Blessed are those who are, they see themselves and they see their weaknesses, they see their flaws. The writer of Proverbs said this, he says, he says uh, cry out to God. He says, uh, invite the, uh, uh, the reproof of the Lord and God will pour his spirit out upon you. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Why? Because some other things happen then. Two verses later, Jesus says, the one who hungers and thirsts for righteousness that one will be satisfied. Not the one who's self-satisfied, not the one who feels like they've figured it all out. Beloved, God has something so much more dynamic for your walk with him, but it requires some hunger and it requires some movement from that end of the rope to this end. Hungering and thirsting not being self-satisfied, as it says here in Revelation chapter 3. We end up plateauing. Here's what happens to us. We say, well, I'm not who I was. I'm not as bad as I used to be. I'm not as angry as I used to be. I'm not as mean as my neighbor. I'm not as drunk as often. I'm not as bitter or as unforgiving. And so we pat ourselves on the back, and we should be encouraged when we take those steps. We should be encouraged with each new victory, each new step we take toward the Lord. We should be encouraged, and we should encourage one another. Sometimes in our marriages, we don't pay attention to the progress of our spouse and encourage them along the way. If Donna wants me to be 100% like holy and 100% loving and 100% humble and all that, she's got a bad job in front of her, doesn't she? But if, but if I'm 50% and I get up to 52 and she pats me on the back and says, way to go, what will happen? I'll be encouraged to keep going. Or if she says, 2%, who cares, butch? Right? We want to encourage each other in each tiny little step that we take toward the hot end of the rope. But saints of God, don't, be, don't settle. Don't settle for, well, I'm a little better than I used to be. I'm warmer, 41 degrees. And when we compare ourselves with other people, we compare ourselves with ourselves, the Apostle Paul said, we are fools. We want to compare ourselves with the Word of God with what he's calling us into and inviting us into. A life filled with his passion, a life filled with his presence, a life filled with his purpose. Who do you want to be personally? Like, you know, Tony was talking about camp, and, and so Tony and I have the unbelievable privilege of being a part of lots of young people's lives through, you know, being involved in camp. 
And I'm constantly talking to these young people about who they are and what they're supposed to, you know, how they, what they can run after. And, and, and they always throw it back at me. Well, like, who do you want to be? What do you want to be? And, and I always tell them this. I want to be a John 15 fruit-bearing believer. I want to be one of those guys that abides in the Lord and bears some fruit. That's it. But what title, what function? Couldn't care less. I want to be someone that abides in the Lord, gets closer to the flame. My heart is changed. I bear more fruit. It's all I want. It's the only thing that matters. I'm a little warmer. I'm a little better. Amen. Just don't plateau there. Some of us are too comfortable with where we're at spiritually. Some of us are too comfortable with how far we've come. I love what Tony was sharing there in the middle about that song reminding him of zealous days in his youth and, and that provocation to get up and run again. So profound. Like I said, lukewarm is not about temperature, it's about temperament. Look at verse 18. He says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. White garments that you may clothe yourself and uh, that the shame of your nakedness won't be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see, verse 19, those whom I love I reprove and I discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. He's talking to the church, people that are warmer than they used to be, and he says, be zealous and change. And I don't know if you're like me, I don't want to change. I'm busy with the way my life is. I, just, I do have a hot wife, and things are good. <laughs> I don't want to change. Harry, be zealous and repent. Amen. Be zealous, Harry. Be fervent about the things of God, different than you were yesterday. Change today. Remember, I have a very nice shirt on. <laughs> Turn to Galatians 5. If you have a Bible and, and we have the lights out bright enough so you can actually see your Bible and, um, or flip your phone or scroll your device. The Christian life is somewhat um, violent. It's cataclysmic. There's... We, we live, the Bible talks about this being an evil age that we live in. The Bible describes the devil as the God of this age. And so there's a conflict going on all the time. And in Galatians 5, I love this passage, verse 16, Paul says this, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. The flesh sets its desire against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Have you seen that to be true? You're just going in life and it seems like I kind of want to go this way, but there's a conflict. And I, so, okay, I'll go this way. No, there's a conflict. Why? The Holy Spirit's inside of you saying, walk this way and the world reject, reacts and rejects that. Your, my own flesh rejects that. And so then when I start to give in and just do the thing of the flesh, the Holy Spirit's going, what are you doing? And so in my own heart, there's this thing, this war waging. How am I going to do it? Walk by the Spirit, Harry, he says. And you won't fulfill the deeds or the desires of the flesh. In Philippians 3, we won't turn there for the sake of time. But in Philippians 3, Paul says this over and over. He says, lay this aside and pursue this. Lay this aside, pursue this. He says, forget, Harry, what lies behind and reach forward for the things that lie ahead. Reach on, press on for the high upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The hot life. Reach for it. Press for it. Get after it. Because who you want to be requires it. I want to be a great husband. I want to be a great father. I want to be a great friend or a great neighbor. I want to be a fruit-bearing believer. I'm telling you, it's about laying aside some things, grabbing onto others. It's about forgetting some things and pressing to others. 
if you want to walk in the high, holy, beautiful calling of God in Christ Jesus. Just make a note of this verse in your own brain. Romans 8, 6, Paul says this, the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. He says the mindset on the flesh is death. Well, here, I don't want death. I'd like life and peace, so I want to put my mind on the spirit. What's that flesh thing, though? It's like everything else. I don't mean your job and like that, but I'm saying we get so distracted by so much that's going on all around us. I worry about way too many things. I contemplate way too many things. Harry, get your mind back on the Holy Spirit. It'll produce life and peace in you. That will produce life and peace in your inner man. If you're like me, I have many things that I'm struggling with today. Things in my own life, things in the lives of those I love. And if I let my mind swirl around all those things that I'm struggling with or my loved ones are struggling with, it produces death. But if I will contemplate God himself, his spirit living inside of me, he might give me a tip on how to live. He might guide me and steer me into paths of peace in the midst of a difficult storm. He may bring me hope and faith in the midst of a difficult circumstance. Life and peace. Turn to Romans 6. I want to talk about this today because here's what happens. You hear a sermon like this and you say, okay, yep, yep, you're right, Harry. I'm a stinker and I should change. And what do I do? How do I change, Harry? How do I, how do I become that person or get closer to the fire? How do I do it? And frankly, Christianity is very practical. And it's very simple. It's just really hard. Do you hear what I just said? It's very simple, but it's very hard. In Romans 6, Paul takes us into this uh, dialogue or, 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 or some time of instruction to simply say a couple of things. I'm going to say them to you, then we're going to look at the passage and, and, and talk about them a little bit there, and then we'll be done. Paul is, in essence, saying in Romans 6 that you, if you belong to Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 says we're new creatures, old things have passed away, new things have come, we're new creations. Paul says here in Romans 6, if you belong to Christ, you are dead to sin. You are dead to the things of this world, and you can live a life unto God. And then he gives us practical ways to do it. I don't, know if I, I don't know about you, but that's good news to me. I don't have to live under the leadership of this world. I don't have to succumb to a cold life or a lukewarm life. I don't have to. And some of us just need to know we have permission to live godly lives. Some of us just need to know that we actually can walk with God in a deep way. In Romans 6, beginning in verse 4, it says this, We who have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as, uh, I skipped a phrase, therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't always feel free from sin. How many of you always feel free from sin? We sing a song, I'm no longer a slave to sin. We sing it, but we sing it kind of with a, um, like, I hope that's true. Like, I hope I get it that I'm free. I hope someday I really feel free. And what Paul says in Romans 6 is that if you have died with him, if you have given your life to him, you are also raised with him. And you today, October 23, 
2022, you are free from sin. Right now. Not just legally, not just because Jesus has forgiven us. Thank God for that. I'm so grateful, aren't you, that all of my crud, he forgives. He forgives. I'm so grateful for that because I'm the worst sinner in the room. I'm so grateful for that. But it's not just that, you guys. He says, you know what? You are free from sin right now. You can walk free from sin. It says right here, you might, uh, in verse 5, you'll certainly be like him in his resurrection. And it says in verse 4, you can walk in the newness of life. We can live differently. We can live hot for God, not lukewarm, not cold, because of what he's provided and what he's offered. Verse 8, now if we have died with him, if we have died with Christ, we believe we shall also Live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For death, the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Listen to this phrase now in verse 11. Even so, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know if you do this routinely. Things happen in your life and you go, you know what? I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to sin. He says in verse 11, consider, meditate upon, declare it to be so. Honestly believe that you are dead to sin right now. Right now. Our struggle is we feel that, that emotion. We feel those things going on in our lives. But, I, but Harry, I sinned like three minutes ago. I was critical of you 30 seconds ago. But I'm dead to sin. <clears throat> Harry Schrader is dead to sin. You say, well, does that mean, Harry, you never sin? Nah. The Apostle John said, if you say if you don't sin, then you're a liar. So we're in this cataclysmic battle, this cataclysmic struggle. But the Bible says, I am dead to it, therefore I have an authority to stand against it. I am dead to it, therefore I can walk uprightly. Consider it to be true. I can't tell you how many times in my own personal life I struggle, I trip into an area of sin or I trip into an area of temptation, and I do this, I'm telling you, like a broken record. I stop myself and go, wait, 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 wait. I am dead dead to sin. Not generally, I'm dead to that one and I'm alive to God. I catch my own heart. I go, wait, wait, wait. I'm dead to that. I don't have to do that. And I'm alive to God. I pause. I get a hold of my own heart. I go, wait, I am dead to this arena of sin, this arena of temptation. I'm alive to God. Something happens inside me, you guys. My heart goes, yeah, you're right. And I begin to walk out of that thing. I'm going to talk more about that, but look at verse 12. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Listen, this is point number two. Point number one is you're dead to sin. You're alive to God. Point number two, you don't have to obey. He says, don't, uh, verse 12, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Here's a really, this is a really deep, profound spiritual thing. When you're tempted to sin, say no. Just say no. Well, Harry, that's hard because I feel, I know. Just say it. Take time. I'm tempted. No. I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to that sin. And I'm alive to God. I'm not going to do that anymore. I don't have to do that anymore. And I might trip and I might do it, right? But here's my point. Because First John says this, when you sin, confess your sin to him. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. There's provision when I do happen to trip, but I don't have to. I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God. Don't let it rain. Say no to it. Say no. Challenge that thing that's raging in you to be unforgiving, to be bitter, to be lustful, whatever it might be. No, I'm not doing it. Verse 12. 
I'll read it again. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Verse 13, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. He says, Harry, listen, you're dead. You don't have to. You can say no, but Harry, here, let's take it next level. Don't go to the arenas where you're tempted. Just avoid those areas. Don't present yourself to situations where you know you're going to blow it. And do present yourself into circumstances and situations where you know you're going to get better. A lot of you know I get up early in the morning. I'm an early morning guy, and I, I get up early in the morning because I want to find God. And, and a lot of the young people go, man, Harry, that's so crazy. You get up early, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. I'm so stinking weak. I've got to find God early or i got problems. I, I try to dig into the word of God. Why? Because I need God. I need to be in, I need to present myself to a place of an instrument of righteousness so that I can encounter him, so that I can get near the fire, so that I can get hotter. Instead, I present myself often to things that are just going to drag me into a pit. I can't tell you how many times over the years guys have told me I really struggled drinking, and I go, well, tell me about your lifestyle. It's really hard here. You know, the guys want to go out and knock back a couple after work, and, and, and I end up drinking too much. Like, no, duh. I said, maybe, maybe don't go. What do you mean, don't go? Well, you, if you want to present yourself to unrighteousness, go ahead. But the problem isn't the one thing. The problem is, is the beginning part. And you can fill in that blank for, with any kind of arena of sin in your life. Maybe you got to, maybe you like to slander your boss. Maybe you like to slander your workers. And so you're with the other leaders, the other supervisors at work, and they go, well, you know, we can't get those kids, and we can't get those people to just cut it off. I'm, I'm dead to that. I'm alive to God. I'm saying no, and I'm also, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to praise that one worker that did a really good thing. I'm going to present myself to righteousness instead. I'm struggling in the area of anger and unforgiveness about someone. So instead of going to present myself to this thing where I'm going to rail that person that I'm, that I'm unhappy with or I'm mad at or wronged me, instead I'm going to figure out a way to present myself to righteousness, pray for them, bless them, Lord, help them, go serve them. I'm going to present myself to a different place. Consider yourselves dead to sin, verse 11. Verse 12, don't let sin reign. In other words, say no. Verse 13, quit presenting yourself to situations that are going to pull you down. And start presenting yourself into situations that will lift you up. That might be a small group here in the church. It might be getting together with other believers in a less formal way to just encourage one another. It might be roaming over to the Gateway House of Prayer and spending time in, in some of those worship sets over there, whatever it takes. Do you ever listen to sermons online? Probably lots of you do. A lot of, you know, we're a podcast generation. Every once, I, I, I do this on purpose. Every once in a while I pop in a preacher I know I won't like that much. <laughs> I do, because I want to be challenged. I want to hear something that's a little bit different than maybe is my cup of tea so that I grow. So I pop in so-and-so, and I just like, listen, man, God, I don't really like that. Oh, that was really good. How, how about that? He's got good stuff to say. <laughs> something changes inside of me. Because I'm valuing another part of the body of Christ. I'm presenting myself to righteousness to hear something a little bit different. Verse 14, for sin shall not be master over you. You are not under law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves of obedience, you are slaves to the one you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart, to that form of teaching which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, 
You can underline that in your Bible later. Having been, past tense, freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms. This is a great verse. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness, resulting in sanctification. So many of us, we, we want to be holy. Who do you want to be? Man, I want to be a man of God. I, I, want, I want to follow God. I want to be a fruit-bearing believer. And he says, well, then just present yourself. As a slave of righteousness, present yourself to those circumstances and situations that will form your life in that direction. So many arenas of my life. I can tell you so many arenas that I'm struggling, still struggling, trying to get somewhere, but so many arenas of my life as I've just continued to present myself to the Lord, like, Lord, in this arena, I'm saying no to it. God, I'm dead to that thing. I'm alive to you. I'm saying no. God, I'm going to make choices. I'm going to go where I'll be provoked to be righteous instead of going where I'll be provoked to be unrighteous. And I found it resulted in something internally. I'm not just legally free. I'm not just occasionally victorious. I'm holy in some areas of my life. Not all of them. And probably not as holy as I think I am in some of those areas that I just told you I was holy in. But what happens is it says it results in transformation of the inner man. It results in transformation. So many young people we deal with, they just, the wind blows here and there and they're pushed back and forth. All the philosophies of the world and I say it about the young people because all of us go, yeah, man, young kids. And we're the same way, just our stick is a little harder and it just does this <laughs> instead of like this, right? It's the same. But if I will say no to it, recognizing that I'm free, he has made me free from sin. And if I'll say no to it because I have the right to, the ability to, and if I present myself to those arenas of righteousness, something transforms in the inner man. And I move down the rope. Here's the problem. I get a little victory, and I want to write a book, do a podcast, high-five everybody, and settle down. <laughs> right, don't we? I get one little victory. I understand one Bible verse, and I tell it to everybody I know for three weeks. I haven't learned anything new in three weeks, but, man, for three weeks, I'm a spiritual giant. <laughs> this is continual, everyday stuff where we just dig in and keep looking to the Lord. Let me give you an example. I've been praying a lot about trying to be more, you know, like aggressive in terms of uh, available to the Lord to reach out to other people. So the other day, I'm, I'm at a hospital. I'm going to visit somebody in a hospital. And I get in the elevator and just strike up a brief conversation with a woman in the elevator. And I said, well, what are you here for? Well, my husband's about to have bypass surgery. I don't even know what kind of bypass surgery, but that seems important. That, like, seems serious to me. And it just captured me. And I said, well, what's his name? And she told me. And I said, could I pray for him? She said, yeah. So I walked over, grabbed her hand, and just started praying. Hot, right? Was that cool? Like, you really think I'm cool now. Well, I mean, you think I'm hot. And, um, and just a couple of days later, like in the same week, we were having some kind of an event at G-Hop, and, and, you know, G-Hop is there at Limburg and Sappington, and there's a bus stop there. Now, this is not a negative about people at bus stops, but often we get people that walk in from the bus stop that are looking for a handout. So we're having this event, and this guy, we get one of those guys. And somebody says, Harry, can you go deal with the guy that's coming in looking for a handout? I'm, absolutely. So I go to talk to the guy. Now, this, we, we have a policy. We don't, we don't give money to people walking off the streets. I pers my personal policy is, well, we don't do that there. We don't do that here. But my personal policy is, I'll listen to them. I never believe their stories, and I just give them money anyway. I don't care. So this guy walks in, he's a guy that's going to tell me a lie, I'm going to give him money, end of story, right? I'm just 
I, I got to get back to the event. He walks in, tells me a story. I said, we don't give money, but could you give me money? I said, listen, we don't, I do. I've got you know, 20 bucks in my wallet, you can have it. And he says, well, I need 25. I said, tough luck. And, uh, and gave him the money, have a nice day, went back to the event. The next day, I just felt like the Lord, like, did you not care what I wanted to do with that guy? Did you not care why I drew him into the building? Give him the couple of bucks, get him on his way so he's not in the way. Now I'm over in this stinking end of the rope. Do you understand? It's just so easy to run hot, run cold, and, and, and so lukewarm sounds really good, doesn't it? I was patting myself on the back for days about praying for the lady in the elevator. And then I ignore the guy that walks right into my life and wants help. So I just want to urge you, I want to call you to something better than Harry, right? Something where, we, where we're pursuing, we're running after. And we can do it in a very practical way. I, I, I just want to conclude by saying this. That Romans 6 is so valuable, this idea that you don't have to be a slave to sin. It is very popular amongst Christians these days to say, well, you know, we're not better than the other people. We're just sinners saved by grace. That's not true. I was a sinner, and I was saved by grace. But the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of me now, and I'm dead to sin, and I'm alive to God. It doesn't make me better than anybody else. But we have this sinner mentality. We have this sinner mentality in us that says, well, I'm just going to be a sinner. I'll never be any better. I'm always going to be a loser because I'm a sinner. May I just say to you today, my friends, you are free from sin. You're dead to sin. You're alive to God. His spirit lives within you. And you can be holy. You can be hot. You can get near the fire if you just don't settle in. Let's stand together and pray. I think the worship team is going to come do something. Is that true, Nathaniel? Do you guys love Nathaniel? I just love Nathaniel. I mean, I like Rachel more, but I mean, I do. <laughs> Anyway, let's pray together and, and just invite the Lord to open our hearts and our minds to this, I, these ideas today. He doesn't want you to be lukewarm anymore simply because you bought the lie that you have to stay there. He has something so much greater for you. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we're grateful that your spirit lives within us. Thankful, Lord, that I don't have to be a slave of sin anymore. I don't have to be lukewarm anymore. I don't have to live in a place of compromise anymore. Father, today I pray for that revelation, that understanding to hit our hearts in a whole new way. That we might begin to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Awaken that reality in us, God. It's true, but we haven't bought in enough. We haven't understood it, God. We haven't believed it. And so I pray that our own hearts could grab onto this idea. We are dead to sin and alive to you. And that we can end up holy. God, what a privilege. What a beautiful thing that is. And just while I'm praying, while we're praying, I just want to say to you that there might be some of you in this room that, that don't know Jesus. You say, Harry, that all sounds good. I don't even know what you're talking about. The Bible simply says this, that Jesus looked at all of us, messed up sinner people. And he said, listen, I want to pay for your sin. I want to come and 
wreck the powers of darkness in your life. We sang the song, two different songs earlier. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. If, if today you're saying, man, I'm in a place where I don't really know God. My sins aren't forgiven. I'm not dead to sin. I'm not alive to God. Today could be your day. Simply invite him to come be the Lord of your life and he will reveal himself to you. As a matter of fact, today, if you're interested in just knowing more about what it looks like to actually be a part of the, far, the family of God, to actually be a part of this thing that I've just described where you could be free from sin and alive to God. It requires something. The Bible simply says uh, that all who are born again can, can walk with him and be his children. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, he, they would have everlasting life. If you're interested in knowing more about that, we're gonna have some people up here ready to pray for you after the service or as they begin to do worship. And they'll talk to you a little bit more about that, pray with you that God would reveal himself to you. Anyway, God, we're grateful. We love you. We desire you, Lord. I pray that if there are any in this room that don't know you yet, God, they would come to know you today before they leave. Some of you are struggling in areas of addiction Areas of perpetual sin, sin that's just got you. Can't see your way out. This message has been hopeful. But that one seems so big. You say, man, I need somebody to stand with me in it. If that's you, feel free to come forward as well. We'll pray for you. That God will set you free. God will bring deliverance to you and to your family in those arenas of addiction and struggle. So if you're a home group leader in the church or one of the leaders in the church, I'd, I'd love for you to be just available to come and pray for people. Tim and Lisa are the pastors here, of course. What? Oh, all right. So anyway, feel free to come and be ready to pray for people. If you need prayer this morning, come ahead. Go ahead, Nathaniel. Even to man's purpose, one main reason for existence, and all men's vain and high ambitions will one day be brought low. Will one day be brought. Treasure you above all that 
Lord, we pray for your blessing upon each and every person here, each family member, God, though our extended families. We ask for your blessing, Lord, today that we might be people numbered amongst those that follow you wholeheartedly, wholehearted followers of Christ Jesus. Lord, we simply invite your leadership by the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the lives of those we love. We declare your blessing now over our friends in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you all. Have a great day. Don't forget next week, Scott gets really old. So uh, encourage him next week. <laughs>